Today we're going to try to wrap up our Enneagram, uh, What is Your Number series. If you've been around for a little bit, you can kind of know we're about 5% Enneagram. The rest we're just going to look into Scripture. But we're going to kind of wrap that up. I'll give you a little bit next week as well, but primarily we're going to start switching gears uh, next week to get ready for the series that we're going to have in March on understanding the enemy. Today we want you to kind of understand more about the way that you're wired, your soul. That's why we're encouraging you to take the Enneagram quiz. If you haven't, it's not a big deal. But we've been encouraging people to do this just to investigate their inner world, understand again more about the way that they're wired. And to give you some quick review, we talked about how the Bible says in Hebrews chapter four and verse 12, that the word of God is living, that it's sharp and it's powerful. And what the word of God does is the... The scripture there says it divides or it cuts asunder. So it moves what soul over here and what spirit over here. That when you use this tool, you use this surgical tool that God has given you, you look into the word of scripture. What it's going to do is it's going to at some point begin to teach you that there's a difference between your spiritual life and your soul local life. And that what Christians have the tendency to do is mix their spirit and their soul. To not distinguish or discern the difference between spirit problems or spiritual issues and what is potentially a solical issue. And so what happens is when you don't know the difference, you end up blaming the devil. You end up blaming the boogeyman for your problems when really it's just a result of a weak soul. You have wrong thinking, so you have wrong feelings. And so you start making wrong choices that it's not necessarily the devil's fault that people are putting drugs in their arms and snorting drugs up their nose and making all kinds of life destroying choices. That's not necessarily the devil. The devil will work in those ways, but most of the time it's just because someone has a weak soul. They don't know how to think, so they don't know how to feel and they don't know how to make the right choices in life. I've been a Christian for almost 30 years. I've been in full-time ministry for 23 years. We've seen thousands of people minister to over all of those years. I've seen two legitimate demon possessions in all of those years. I've been to India. I've been to Haiti. You name it, two legitimate demon possessions. But I've watched thousands of people make dumb, idiotic, stupid choices and blame the devil for it. So what we're going to do is major on soul just just for this this again, just during this series. And we're going to try to minor on the spirit side of things for just a little bit. Again, when the word of God says, well, this is spirit and this is soul, it helps us begin to know that we are a triune being, that you are a spirit, you possess a soul and you live in a body, that your body gives you world awareness. Your body is in your senses, what you can see, what you can taste, what you can hear, what you can feel, gives you a sense of the world. It gives you a sense of your limitations, the limits of your body. This morning I was getting ready and all this gray is coming in right here. It's giving me a sense of physical awareness that my time is ticking, my time is short. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Things are changing, things are starting to you know, wrinkle up a little bit and things are losing their flavor and their color. And I'm getting older and my body tells me, Hey, you don't have forever. When I wake up in the morning and I feel like I got hit by a truck and I did nothing but just sleep the night before. Anybody know my hip hurts and my knee hurts and my neck hurts. And all I did was sleep the night before. It's telling me, my body's telling me I'm getting, things are changing. I know to not play on the interstate because a bus, a truck's going to hit me. My body tells me there's limits. There are things I can do and things I can't do. So that's how I have world awareness. My spirit is what gives me God awareness. When I become a Christian, the Bible says my spirit come, become, comes alive or is reborn. Before that moment, I'm disconnected from God. I, my relationship with God is not active. But when I invite Christ into my heart, my spirit is reconnected with God, my spirit man, my, the place that God does a work in my life, God does a work in your heart, is in your spirit that comes alive to God, that is reborn. And from that moment on, you have a God awareness. 
Nothing's going to be perfect from that moment on. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin. You're going to fail. You're going to have ups and downs. But from that point on, once your spirit comes alive, you will have a God awareness. You will have a sense of the presence of God, the activity of God in your life. Ups and downs, but you'll have that God awareness. So my spirit gives me God awareness. My body gives me world awareness and my soul is where I have self-awareness. And my soul is the way I think, the way I feel, and the choices that I make. The way I think, the way I feel, and the choices that I make. What we saw was the Enneagram is broke down into triads. So you have the head triad, the heart triad, and the gut triad, which all represent parts of the soul. Again, the head triad, that's the, the part of the soul, the way you think. The heart triad, that's the way you feel. The gut triad, that's your instinct, your action people. And so that represents the area of the soul where, where we make choices and we make decisions. And so our goal has been to try to understand a little bit more about who we are and the way we're wired. One of the things that the Enneagram does is it not only shows you what your number is, and then there's your wing number. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, just hang on because we're just going to breeze through this real quick. But there's also what they call your arrows. And one of the things that your arrows do is it shows you what your life is like, what your inner world is like when you're at your safest or your healthiest. And it also shows you what the characteristics or the clues of your life will look like when you are in an unhealthy place. So for example, let's look at this real quick. If you're a two, how many twos do I have in here? Got several twos. If you're a two and you're in a healthy place, then you'll resort, your arrow will resort to the characteristics of a four in a positive way. You'll understand the need for self-care. You'll be generous to love and care for others, loving and lovable. You'll adapt well to change, confident, independent, and sure of themselves. That's what your life looks like. Your soul, your inner world looks like when you're in a healthy place and you're uh, a type two or a helper. If you're unhealthy, you, your arrow goes to the unhealthy characteristics of an eight and you'll be dependent on others for affirmation, insecure, manipulative. You'll play the role of a martyr. You'll have great expectations on others to meet your needs, depending and controlling, blame others for being unhappy. What I want you to catch is that there are clues to, the Enneagram gives you clues to an unhealthy soul. And that's what we're going to work on. We're going to work on the areas of our life maybe were unhealthy and how the scripture teaches us that we can get a healthy soul. So Romans chapter eight, verse five, it says, those who live according to the flesh or their body, this is your world awareness. You're living according to what you can see, touch, feel, taste, hear. All that's influencing you is what's in the world. When you live according to that, then your mind, this is your soul, the way you think, the way you feel, the choices that you make, your soul is what set on what the flesh desires. So if you're living just based upon what you can see, the culture of this world, the environment of this world, what you listen to, what you watch, what influences you, if that's what you're If your life is being led by that, what happens is your mind will be set on those things. What pleases the flesh, what makes the flesh happy. And you know, the flesh just loves you just to pet it. Come on, just loves you to nurture it. Just treat me good. Do what I, the flesh don't like pain. The the flesh don't like discomfort. We don't, we, so, so, but if you just follow that, then your mind and your soul will join forces with your body, your flesh, and it will accomplish what the flesh desires. But it says, those who live in accordance with the spirit, this is your God awareness. You live in accordance with the, your God awareness is what's leading your life. What does it say? Your mind, so your soul will join forces. And what does it say? It'll be set on what the spirit desires. So the first key to understanding your soul, how to have a healthy soul, is that two are stronger than one. That if your flesh joins with your soul, your, what your flesh wants gains control of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And they join forces, they come into agreement, they gang up, if you will, they'll overpower and overrule 
your spirit life or the God awareness part of who you are. They're going to do everything they can to push that down, push that out. We don't want God. We don't want what the spirit of God wants for us. We don't want what the scripture says. We don't, we don't want none of that. We want what we want. The flesh will, if it, if it gets the soul on board, will only fulfill its own desires. On the flip side, if the spirit, if the God awareness in you takes the lead, the Bible says as many are the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. The word led means lasso. If you'll let God lasso you, leads you, come on, he's just going to kind of pull you in the direction he wants you to go. What happens is the Bible says then your soul will join forces, will come into agreement with your spirit, that they'll gang up and your life will end up fulfilling the desires of what the Spirit of God wants for your life. And they'll overpower and they'll overrule what your flesh wants. So no matter how much your flesh kicks and screams, no matter how much your flesh whines and complains, it says, I don't like it, it's too hard. Serving God's too hard. Going after the heart of God's too difficult. You're, no matter how your spirit and your soul will say, shut up, quiet down. You're not in control. You're not in the driver's seat of my life. You don't have the final say. I'm a son or I'm a daughter of God and the spirit of God is lassoing me and leading me to the destiny that God has for me. Galatians 5, 17 teaches us there's never a day that the flesh and the spirit are not contrary to one another. There's never a day that they're not in conflict with one another. Every day you wake up, your flesh is going to try to take control. You're a child of God. You love God. You, you gave your life to Christ. You have a God awareness. But every day the flesh is going to try to take back control. And how does a Christian, someone that loves God, end up only fulfilling the desires of their worldly awareness. What happens with them is their spirit is weak because their body, their flesh, and their soul, the two are stronger than the one. So how do you know if, if you're being led by the spirit of God in your life, or how do you know if you're being led by the flesh or the worldly awareness in your life? Well, the scripture goes on to say there in Galatians, verse 19, that we can tell which one's leading based on this simple principle, which one are you feeding? So your flesh will take the lead if you feed your flesh. Your spirit can take the lead if you'll feed your spirit. So if all you do is feed your flesh, and by the way, it doesn't matter who you are, you're every single day of, your, of, of the week, you wake up, you get out of bed, the world is going to feed your flesh. You can't escape it. You can't stop it. The table has been set. It is out there. You're just going to choose how much you consume of what the world is putting on the table of your life. Because if you just feed, if you feed your flesh, your life will be led by your flesh. And then what happens all day, every day, all week, and then you come over here and you come to church one day a week for 30, 45 minutes and you, you feed your spirit and that's all your spirit gets then your spirit's gonna struggle to lead because it's not being fed in the same way that you're feeding these other areas of your life. So a real big key for a Christian is not that you're not exposed to the world, but are you feeding your spiritual life? Because if you'll feed your spirit, then your spirit will have the strength and it'll join forces with your soul and it will overpower all the things that are trying to draw you into living, living beneath the best and the will of God for your life. So verse 19 says, this is what your life looks like. I'm going to read from the Message Bible. This is what your life looks like if you feed the flesh. It says it's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, I could go on. He's basically saying, we, the, if you feed your flesh, it will ruin your life in every possible way. If you let your flesh lead your life, it will lead to every type of decision, choice and decision that will lead to destruction. But 
it goes on to say, what happens when you live God's way? What happens when you feed your spirit? He brings gifts into our lives. Much the same way a fruit appears in an orchard, things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. We don't use legalism to bring this about. It only gets in the way among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities. That's all killed off for good. That's all crucified. Since this is the kind of life we've chosen, the life of the spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implication in every detail of our lives. This means we will not compare ourselves with each other other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives because each one of us is an individual. So whichever one you're feeding, your spirit or your flesh is the one that's leading. If you're unhealthy in your soul, you'll insulate, you'll shut down, You'll feel overwhelmed, stressed, anxious, moody, always late, agitated, eating disorders, overspending disorders. You'll not want to get out of bed in the morning. You'll use addictive behaviors to numb and not deal. Poor relationship decisions. Spiritually, things will always sound dumb. Church sounds dumb. Worship sounds dumb. The Bible sounds dumb. All the spiritual things, they just don't, they sound Like they're just for those crazy, radical Christians, those Bible thumpers. That's what people, that's what your flesh will tell you. You'll end up being defensive, argumentative, judgmental, harsh, no flexibility, rigid, insecure, no peace, no joy. What happens when your flesh gets control? It'll push God out. It'll push God away. And it will end up, by the way, not just pushing God out, but medical science confirms that all mental and emotional dysfunction will cause physical problems. More and more people are taking prescription medicines, which again, if you need that, I'm not, I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying that a lot of our physical problems aren't even physical, they're learning. It's downstream from your soul. It's your, it's your, you're not learned how to have a healthy soul and downstream from that mental and emotional stress causes ulcers, skin rashes, immune system declines because the devil gains access to your inner world when you allow the flesh to lead. So many of our issues are the result of what happens when we let the flesh take the lead. Paul prayed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he prayed and he said that, I pray that I could present the churches, that the people in the church, whole and complete body, soul, and spirit. So when God does a work in your life, he doesn't want you just to get saved so you can go to heaven. He doesn't want you just to have a God awareness. That's that's where it begins. But he wants you to be whole and complete in your spirit, in your soul, and in your body. God wants to completely do everything he can to get your spirit and your soul into agreement. When you become a Christian, you become a brand new person, but your soul is still learning to come in line with the truth of what God's done in your spirit life. And so the devil will try to gain access to your soul through your body, and you have to learn to let the Holy Spirit have access to your life. And the way he accesses your life is through you being led by the Holy Spirit. This takes time. This is a lifelong process. You never arrive. You're going to constantly have to renew your mind, renew your emotions, renew your choices. You're going to have to make a decision. I'm going to quit blaming the devil for everything. I'm going to quit blaming the boogeyman for everything. I'm going to be sensitive and in tune, and I'm going to be focused on what the Holy Spirit is wanting me to do. I'm going to be dedicated to building a healthy, strong, brilliant soul. I'm going to make it decision. I'm going to take responsibility for the way I think, the way I feel, and the choices I make. And how we allow the Holy Spirit, how we allow the Holy Spirit to feed us is through his work 
in our lives, when we're in the house of God, when we're in an atmosphere of faith, when we're in atmospheres of teaching and preaching, wisdom and instruction, prayer, atmospheres of prayer, atmospheres where you can read the scripture in your personal and your private time, atmosphere where you, you, your flesh can be reminded that it's not in control, that we're serving the kingdom of God, we're advancing the kingdom of God. We want to be in atmospheres where we're planted in places that win souls, that embrace the presence of God, embrace reaching a dying and hurting world, putting yourself in that it feeds your spirit making sure your young people are in youth ministries, making sure our children have the, that's why we're investing five million in our children. Why? Because at a young age, we want them to learn. It's not all just about world awareness and what your flesh wants, but we want them at a young age to learn to be led by the spirit of God, their soul join forces and them overrule the carnal natures that we're all born with. Finding small groups, finding Bible studies, finding ways to serve with your gifts. We sit at God's table every week and we feed on the word of God. We feed on the presence of God. And what happens when we do that? It helps us make quality choices. It helps us be directed by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It helps us get to a place where we know God is in control, that our mind, our will, and our emotions are submitted to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, he leads us to productive, healthy, strong, wise living. Come on. That's what he does for you. No, it's all the devil. It's all demons. The devil did it. The demons did it. He had nothing to do with you being late to work. He has nothing to do with you're not on budget. I appreciate it's an easy thing to do, but can we just take just a second and be grown up? The Bible says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I did things like a child. But now that I'm grown up, I put away childish things. At some point, you got to know God has equipped us with everything we need to build a healthy, strong soul. When God created you, he created you as a spirit first. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, what's the Bible say? God knew you. So before you were the very first cell, the physical cell, before your body was one cell, God knew you because you were created spirit, then body and soul. Are you here? The reason that God created you in that order is because that order represents the way that God wants you to be led in life. Your body was not first, and so it should not lead your life. Your spirit was first. It knew God before you were even formed in your mother's womb. And if you let your spirit start to be connected to God, aware of God, feeding it spiritual things, then it will lead you to the place that God sent you on this planet. He knew the day you would live. He knew the place that you would live. He knew everything about you, and he placed you here so you could fulfill his destiny and purpose for your life. So your soul is only as good as what you've been leading, allowing to lead it and what you've been feeding it. So everyone in this room, every person that's here today is in a place in their life where they've been feeding their mind something. They've been feeding for the years, the months, the weeks, the days leading up to this moment. Your mind is only as healthy as what you've been feeding it. Your emotions are only as stable and reliable as the years, the weeks, the days leading up to this moment right now. And if you've just been feeding your flesh, feeding your body, feeding off of those things, then what happens is your body and your life and your mind and your world at some point hits a wall. You start to reach out for answers. You're in the struggle, you're in the trial. You're in the fire of life. And because you've just been feeding your flesh, feeding that world awareness, feeding what makes the flesh feel good, the flesh goes to reach to the mind for answers. And you know what the answer does when you're in the fire of life? It hands you gasoline instead of water. And then you're saying, why do things keep getting worse and worse and worse? It started like this, but now it's out of control. What happened? What caused it to go crazy? It's because you haven't fed your soul the right things. But if you'll allow your spirit to lead your life 
and life throws something at you that's bigger than you and you don't have the answers and you don't know what to do and this time it's bigger than you and this time God probably highly overestimated your ability to make it through but you take those problems, you take those struggles, you take the confusion, you take the hurt, you take the wound, you take all that and you give it to your spirit. Your spirit has never been given anything that it cannot handle. The spirit in you can handle anything this world throws at you because your spirit was created to lead. Your spirit was created to be the chairman of the board. Your spirit was made, created by God, equipped by God to be the CEO of your life. And what your flesh will try to tell you to do is put the spirit in the back seat. Put the God awareness in the back seat. Let that just have, just, just shut up, be back there. We don't need no back seat driver. We got control and it's going to run your life off a bridge into a river. That's what your flesh does. It just does what it desires and it always ends in and destruction and death. But when God saved you, he didn't just save you in your spirit so you can go to heaven. He is on a total invasion program. He wants to get a hold of your soul, the way you think, the way you feel, and the choice you make. And by the way, he even wants to bless your physical world and your body as well. This is why 3 John 1 and verse 2 says, I pray above all brethren that you prosper in health. That's your external world. That's your physical world even as or keeping with your soul prospering. So God isn't just, oh, I died on a cross just so you could go to heaven. That's not what he did. He died and he wants to start with the God awareness, start by giving you a rebirth with that God connection, but he wants to join forces with your soul. He wants you to get truth in your soul and the way you think. And then he wants you to make such brilliant choices that it ends up blessing your external world so you prosper in health even as or even with your soul prospering and being healthy and being strong. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm not going to go there, verses 10 through 16, lets us know that the Spirit of God is never confused. The Spirit of God always knows what you need to do in every situation. The Holy Spirit knows exactly which step to take, the direction to head, and the choice you need to make. And when the Holy Spirit's in the driver's seat, he always leads us to a more reliable, more stable, more loving, more integrous, more excellent, more sincere, more giving, more prayerful place. Why? Because we have access as God's people to his word and to his spirit What we can know, if we will access what the tools that God has given us, what he'll lead us to, he'll always lead you and I to being the best version of who God's created us to be. We'll always be above only, never beneath. We'll be the head and not the tail. I'm not saying you'll never have struggle. What I'm saying is if you allow the spirit of God to lead you, at the end of the day, you'll get victory over the things the enemy is going to try to pull you down with. How many of y'all know this is easy preaching, hard living, right? It's one thing to say, oh, I'm a spirit-led Christian. It's another thing to live that way. Well, thankfully, we have this beautiful moment. I mean, it's just this great picture of how this works when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew chapter 26, we see how this struggle works for all of us. And we see that not only is it difficult for us, but it was difficult for Jesus as well. This is a struggle. This is an agonizing struggle that we enter into trying to let the spirit lead the way and try to tell the flesh, hey, listen, you're not in control. Because the flesh, the the way flesh works, the way your body works, God made it to be a servant to what your spirit wants you to do. Your flesh is a terrible master. It's a terrible leader. It's a great servant. I heard... uh, an uh, old preacher, Dave Summerall, he's a good friend of mine, his great grand or his grandfather, excuse me, Lester Summerall, used to say, the only thing I'll give my flesh is I give it a five minute hot shower in the morning and I don't let my flesh have anything else for the rest of the day. I'm not saying you have to go to that extreme, but do you get what I'm saying? That if you let it, your whole life will be driven to make the, this feel good. And, and your spirit will have No say in your life if you're not careful. So Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible says that he's 
got the disciples with him. And he tells the disciples to sit over there and pray. And he took Peter and a couple of the sons of Zebedee along with him. And it says that he was sorrowful and troubled. Verse 38, then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed. My soul has such sorrow, it's to the point of death. How many of you know he's, he's really struggling here? Jesus is saying, internally, I'm in such a struggle, I feel like I, can, I can't even live another day. So he's in a real dilemma. This is no fake moment. This is no, you know, there's no way to Christianize this. Jesus is saying, on the inside, things are so terrible, I almost wished I would die. Think about that. And in this moment, he goes out a little bit further, falls on his face on the ground. His sweat become great drops of blood. And he says, my father, if it is possible, may you take this cup from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus is saying, my spirit has led my whole life. Now here I am in Gethsemane and my soul is so overwhelmed. My soul is so troubled. There's such sorrow in my soul. It's trying to hijack me from the destiny that God's called me to. And he's agonizing. He's trying to keep his spirit in the driver's seat. But the body is screaming. I don't want to be nailed to that cross. I don't want to be beaten. I don't, I don't, I don't want to have my back ripped open. I, I, don't, I don't want to be pierced. I don't want to be pulverized by men's fists. I, I, I don't enjoy that. His soul is saying, I don't, I don't enjoy being rejected and betrayed and being filled with sorrow. I don't, we don't want this. And his body and his soul are trying to join forces. Can you see it? They're trying to come into agreement. They're trying to gang up and his body starts to sweat blood and his mind starts to argue, find a way out of this. There's got to be an easier way. There's got to be a better way. Surely a loving father would not be allowing you to go through these kind of struggles and troubles in your life. And Jesus concludes by saying, listen, it's not my mind. It's not my emotions. These are not my choices. This is not even my body, not my will, but your will be done. This is this soul. This is yours. This body, this is yours. And I'm going to let the spirit of God lead me. And I'm not going to let my flesh or my soul or my struggle or my pain talk me out of the God-given de destiny that I have on my life. He gets victory in that moment. He's winning the battle, but he goes to look for encouragement from his disciples. And the Bible says he goes to them and look at what happens. He finds them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? And he asked Peter, would you watch and pray so you not fall into temptation? And then he tells him this, the spirit, your God awareness is willing. But what, what's he saying? Your flesh is weak. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, I'm over here fighting the spiritual battle. I'm fighting to keep my spirit in the driver's seat. I'm overwhelmed. This is not an easy battle. But he prays and he wins the battle in his soul. And the spirit stays in the driver's seat. And he comes back and he sees his men that their mind is weary, their emotions are weary, and the body says, ah, just rest, just relax, just take a nap, just find, it's, it's not overt sin. It's not some great kind of sin. It's just allowing the weakness in your flesh to control your life, even in crucial, godly, divine, spirit-led moments. Ah, my flesh. You know, there are people that knew they should be at church today and they woke up and their flesh let them. Ah, just stay back. If you're watching online, we love you. But you know what I'm saying? Hey, it's okay. It's, it's fine. I do it too. I do it too. I don't, I'm not here every week, so settle down. It's okay. Don't turn it off right now. Just trying to build them up. Just trying to build them up at your expense. That's all that we're doing right now. <laughs> the 
their body and their mind is so tired, it ta- their body and their mind join forces. And Jesus comes back and says, listen, man, I need you right now to not let your emotions and your body take over. I need you to stay in this with me. Your spirit's willing. Your spirit's ready. Your spirit's able. And Jesus goes back and he wins the victory a second time. And he walks out of the Garden of Gethsemane. And the first thing he hits is the soldiers come to arrest him. And if he did not win the battle in the spirit, if he had not made sure my body and my mind and my emotions do not have the final say, what God's will, what God's word and what God's spirit is what controls and leads my life. Not my opinion, not my thoughts, not my wishes, not what feels good to my flesh, not my world awareness, not what the media says or the political landscape says or the current culture of this world says. No, that's not what the Spirit of God says. That's what leads me. What the Word of God says, that's what leads me. And he goes out and he's being arrested and his body is screaming, defend yourself. He's taken where he's falsely accused and they sentence him to death by execution on a cross. And his body and his soul is saying, defend yourself. But the spirit said, don't say anything. I've got you. Don't worry about what they're doing to you. Don't worry about your body. Don't worry about your emotions. I'm leading you. I'm, I'm ordering your steps right now. And they take him and they beat his back. And they put the cross on him and he's carrying it through Jerusalem as they're beating him. He collapses under the weight of the cross and his body is screaming at him. Come on, you don't need to do this. Come on, throw in the white towel. Come on, why are you going through all this for these crazy people? Just call down a legion of angels and let's get you out of this situation. But he keeps pressing through and he gets to Calvary and there he's hanging and bleeding and dying. They pierce his side. All of the time that this happens, his body is, he cries out at this moment, my God, my Father in heaven, why hast thou forsaken me? I've been following the leadership the Holy Spirit. And now I'm beaten and now I'm bloody and my face and my body are pulverized. Where are you? What God, why have you left me like this in this situation? But he stays consistent with what the Spirit of God wants him to do. He dies and his spirit, the Bible says, his body is dead. But the spirit, the Bible says, goes and conquers death, hell and the grave. And on the third day, that old body gets back up. What was broken and dead, God raises it back up. And it teaches us that whenever the Spirit of God leads your life, you'll have crosses. You'll have moments of confusion. You'll have moments where you feel like, God, where are you at? You'll have times where you feel like God's left you. He's he's dropped you. He's nowhere to be found. But if you'll keep on being led by the Spirit of God, you can know that God through His Spirit and through His power will always lead you to a place of resurrection. He can raise up that marriage no matter how lifeless it looks. He can raise up, come on, those kids no matter how lifeless they look. I wish I could get about five people to be led by the Spirit of God and know, hey, listen, God can resurrect any lifeless thing if you'll just be led by the Spirit of God. Come on, let Him lasso you. Would you just let Him pull you? Come on, would you quit letting your flesh pull you into all that negativity, all that death? Come on, all that compromise, all that excuse making. Don't let the Spirit of God pull you into life and a life more abundantly, by the way. Come on, can we lift our hands in His presence? Come awaken you people. Come on, what we're going to do, we're setting the table. Go ahead, keep singing. As they're singing, I want you to worship with me. And as you worship, what you're going to do is you're going to feed your spirit, man. Let's go ahead. Come on, lift your hands towards heaven. Come on, shut your flesh off. Come on, shut all that carnal, the worldly stuff off. Come on, reach up towards heaven and get get into your Gethsemane moment and let God give you the victory in that struggling place. 
Come on, by the Spirit, win the victory. By the Spirit, get a, get a glimpse that the dream will live again. The marriage will live again. Joy will come again. The peace of God will come again. You get a picture of it in your spirit first. Lord, we reach up and we grab all that you have for us in the presence of God. Oh, feed our spirit man. We join forces today to overcome the carnal parts of who we are. You know what the Bible says? It says you got to tell your flesh. It says you got to beat your body into subjection. It says you got to crucify your flesh. We don't talk about this stuff in church anymore. I'm sorry. This is, I thought this was supposed to be a negative, make you feel good about everything church. You got to crucify your flesh. You got to die. The Bible says daily, every day, you got to take your old body and you got to throw it up on the cross and like Jesus, make a decision. It's not easy. It's agonizing, but I'm going to be led by God's spirit. Come on, not just on a Sunday morning, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? All week, every day, I'm going to let my spirit take the lead in Jesus name. So Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that what you're calling us into, we do not have to do alone. You know, I was reading real quick, just to interrupt my prayer, I'm sorry. God, wait, we'll get right back to you. Commercial break. But if we went back to Romans 8, it, a couple verses before in Romans 7, Paul's saying, the things that I should do, I don't do. The things I shouldn't do, I do. But he says something really interesting in that. He says, but I've come to learn that the, when I'm doing the things that I shouldn't do, that it's not me. Which is a bizarre way to say it. He says, I've learned that, I've learned that who I am, who God's made me to be, there are times when my life don't look like that. There are times when I'm saying, take this cup from me. There's times when I'm sleeping and I should be praying. There's times when I'm coming up with excuses, when I'm supposed to be saying, okay, I need to take this one on the chin. I need to take this, I need to, I need to grow up here. There are times like that. He said, I've learned to know that that's not me. Watch this, this is so interesting to me. That the failure is not you. The mistake is not, the divorce isn't you. The addiction, that's not you. What the devil wants to do is he wants to take all that and say, see, See, you're not really, you don't really love God. You're not really a Christian. Now you're learning to be a spirit-led Christian, but it doesn't cease to make you any less of a Christian. You're just learning to get your soul to line up with it. So what did Paul say? He said, yeah, I sometimes do things I don't wanna do, and I sometimes don't do things I know I should do. But he says, I've learned there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What he learned to do was he learned to say, hey, listen, my flesh is not only going to drive me to a place of wanting to do dumb things, then when it gets me to do dumb things, it's going to try to tell me, it's going to try to tell me that you're this, you're that, you're fake, you're a hypocrite, you're a fraud, you're not the real deal, you're not a real Christian. If you really love God, you'd be like this or you'd be that. That's what you, your flesh is going to take you to a place of failure and mistake, and then it's going to condemn you for it. But the Spirit of God, that's not the way the Spirit of God works. The Spirit of God, when it leads you, even when your flesh, you lean into things you shouldn't do, the Spirit of God saying, ah, that's not you. That's not you, that's not you. Don't let the, your flesh condemn you. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And he'll lead you, the Bible says, into a life of freedom from that. So none of us, except Jesus, have this down perfectly. 
but we become more skilled each step of the way by letting the Word of God say, that's a spirit problem, that's a soul problem, and letting the Spirit of God help us in the way we think, the way we choose, come on, the choices we make. And so, Father, I thank you right now and coming back to you now in this moment of prayer. We thank you that even in moments like this, in your presence, we're reminded of the great gift that we have through the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is always leading us always leading us to places of greater freedom, places of greater wisdom, places of greater, places of greater victory in our life. So Father, I pray for each and every one of these amazing, precious people that are here tonight. May we leave this room knowing how to feed the Spirit of God more in our life than ever before. In Jesus' name. If you receive that, if you believe that, would you give God a good hand clap of praise with me? watching Seven Hills Church's YouTube channel. I think there's a couple next steps for you as you're watching. First of all, I wanted to let you know you can join us live for our online experiences, totally interactive, live chat. We'd love to have you join us there. Also, don't forget if you don't want to miss out on all the new content that gets posted on our YouTube channel to subscribe. Thank you again for watching and we'll see you guys this weekend.